Hello, and welcome to the Rockford Systems Machine Safety Compliance 101 webinar. We are ready to begin and happy to see so many people joining us today. My name is Carrie Halley, and I'm the moderator for today's session. Your presenter is Mr. Roger Harrison, our trainer, public speaker, and resident blogger with over 25,000 hours of machine safeguarding standards and regulations training experience to share with you today. The focus of today's webinar will be on the OSHA and ANSI standards as they relate to specific machine applications and product requirements. Of course, this is a big topic, so we'll do our best to provide a broad overview. For anyone that feels that they need more in-depth training after today's webinar, we encourage you to consider our two-day training seminars either at our or your location. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. You have arrived in mute mode so that the presenter can speak clearly without background noise. We will have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, so please type your question in the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we will get to the questions at the end. Also, please do stay until the end of the webinar so that you can cast your vote in our poll to help us improve the quality of these webinars for the future. Slides can be downloaded directly from your control panel, and we are recording today's webinar, and the recording will be emailed to you a day or two after today's uh, session. Alternatively, you can watch the recording on our YouTube channel or on our website under resources and videos at any time. Okay, so before Roger gets started, please allow me to introduce Rockford Systems to you. We are located in Rockford, Illinois offering quality machine safety solutions since 1971. As a trusted advisor to industry, we educate organizations on how to interpret and apply the complex OSHA regulations and ANSI and NFPA standards for machine guarding. Today's webinar is a snippet of our comprehensive training and education offering. In addition, Rockford offers a full suite of machine safety solutions, including on-site risk assessments, on-site machine surveys, customized engineering integration solutions, over 10,000 safeguarding products, expert installation services, technical and in-field support, and ongoing compliance validation. Our trusted safeguarding solutions exceed OSHA regulations and ANSI standards. Please visit our website to learn more. So if we're going to talk about machine safety compliance, we really need to understand why safeguarding machines is important. So first and foremost, I think everyone can agree that safeguarding helps keep people safe. As reported in Safety and Health, a lack of machine guarding is consistently on OSHA's top 10 most cited violations report, resulting in over 7 million in fines each year. The actual price tag for an injury, though, is much higher than simply the citation because indirect costs such as damaged facilities or equipment, medical expenses, lawsuits, lost productivity, and so forth must also be taken into consideration. Worst of all, these accidents can cause extremely severe, potentially life-changing injuries to employees or even death. It's estimated that workers who operate and maintain machinery suffer approximately 18,000 amputations, lacerations, crushing injuries, abrasions, and most profoundly, more than 800 deaths per year. In 2016 alone, 88% of the total number of OSHA machine guarding violations were classified as serious, meaning one in which there was a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could relate and that the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. We estimate that an alarming 50% or more of metal fabricating machines in the United States do not comply 
with the critical safety requirements regarding outlined by OSHA and ANSI. In addition, safeguarding offers a positive return on investment. We uh, won't get into that today, but for an in-depth analysis of the safeguarding ROI, please check out our recent blog post on this very topic, which also includes an ROI calculator. And lastly, it is the law. And that's the part that we're here to talk about today. Our covered topics today include um, really everything OSHA 1910.212, ANSI B11.19, including awareness barriers, point of operation guards, guard opening scales, interlock switches, function testing, safety distances, dropout protection, perimeter guards and conveyors, disconnect switches, safety blocks, um, uh, electronic devices, safety mats, two-hand controls, present sensing devices, drop probe, drop probe devices, electrical control boxes, uh, shields, automation cells for robots, and NFPA 70E and 79 electrical standards. And now I will turn it over to Roger Harrison. Good morning. Welcome to our webinar. We're going to be talking about machine safeguarding today, which is largely based on not only the Occupational Safety and Health Administration regulations, but ANSI B11 safety standards, which have been around since the 1920s. Um, this is mostly for metalworking machines, but a lot of this does carry over to other equipment. We'll also be talking about NFPA 79 the electrical standard for industrial machines, not to be confused with NFPA 70E, which gets into arc flash. We'll mention that later. I think the most stringent thing out there today would be the Western European regulations, which Canada usually follows as well. OSHA's most general requirement is 1910-212, which requires the employer to protect the operator and other employees in the machine area from exposure to recognized hazards. Point of operation is where the machine comes together to manufacture the part. A lot of serious injuries there, so a lot of emphasis on point of operation safeguarding. Ingoing nip points and rotating parts, we're talking about needing covers for those up to at least a seven foot level from the floor along with flying chips and sparks, which is oftentimes where the shields come in that we're going to talk about later. Because OSHA does have a specific requirement here for flying chips and sparks. Examples of safeguarding methods would include two-hand actuators, electronic safety devices, which is like infrared light curtains, as well as area laser scanners, as well as the laser scanning devices recently developed for hydraulic press brakes. Five safeguarding methods in ANSI B1119. And by the way, B1119 is probably the ANSI standard that you want to get a hold of if you want a good explanation on machine safeguarding. And again, this carries over to a lot of industries. <clears throat> so guards are something constructed either at the point of operation or a perimeter fence, which should prevent access to the point of operation, meaning somebody can't get around that guard even if they really try. Devices control access to the point of operation, like for instance, uh, light curtains as an example. Safeguarding by distance, also known as safe holding, is for large bulky piece parts that require the operator to hold it with both hands to support the part. The dimensions are not really specified. You have to come up with that when you do a risk assessment on your machines. Location is also known as safe position of operator controls puts the operator at a safe location, that is a distance away from the hazard. And again, that's not specifically identified, identified as to that distance. Safe opening is currently a quarter inch or less at the point of operation where the machine is fully open. Although the ANSI B1119 safety standard is currently being revised, hopefully done by the end of this year or early 18. And as I understand that quarter inch is changing 
to say you can't get a body part into that opening or some such language. It's not going to actually identify a number like it currently does. Risk assessment, <clears throat> sometimes called a hazard analysis, if you go back to older terminology, requires that the employer look at three basic areas, severity of injury, the probability of injury, and the frequency of exposure. You go through the risk assessment process, which is a matrix type thing, which we're not going to do in this class, and select a number value from each of the three color groups. Then you stack those up, put them next to a scale over on the right-hand side to determine if you have low or medium or high exposure. Now, the idea is the higher the level of exposure, the more effective the safeguarding needs to be. If you come down in the lower section where it says severity plus probability plus frequency equals the level of exposure to hazards, you notice there's a fourth one that was not up above, and that's avoidance, able to avoid the exposure to the hazard. Well, that recently came up with uh, those of you who have press breaks in the 2012 version of ANSI B11.3. They talk about the possibility of safe speed safeguarding, which has been in the European requirements for quite a while, but it's just coming over to us. This is the first ANSI B11 standard it shows up in. So they're saying if you have a hydraulic press brake or possibly a servo drive press brake, that you can limit the ram speed to 10 millimeters uh, per second or less. That's considered a method of safeguarding, safe speed safeguarding. So actually, we have four considerations here. Severity, probability, frequency, and avoidance is coming in now. Look down here at the bottom. It's talking about ANSI B11.0, 2015, the safety of machine, machinery. That's the best place to get risk assessment information, along with the matrix as to how to do risk assessments. Moving on to rotating and reciprocating components that can entangle people. Um, OSHA needs covers over these up to at least a seven foot level from the floor or working platform. Seven feet from the floor to meet OSHA, eight feet from the floor if you want to meet the best safety practices and the more current up-to-date ANSI standards. Because remember these OSHA regulations on machine guarding that came out within the early 70s uh, for the most part have not been updated. The ANSI standards, on the other hand, get updated every five years or so, so you have a lot more current information in ANSI than you do in OSHA. Talk about lower level hazard exposures, like for instance, the coil payoffs that feed a press, let's say here. Notice we've got either chains or railings or something that surrounds the coil payoff equipment, but not to the level of a guard. For protection. These are just discouraging somebody from getting in by outlining the hazard area. So they'd have to make a conscious effort and contact with the railing chain or cable to get past it. Now the only thing that's missing in most of these photographs is danger warning signs. Preferably danger warning signs that specify what the hazard is in going beyond the awareness barrier. Now in the top left photograph, you can see a tail out barrier there. That's for when the coil stock is run out on the mandrel. You don't want the end of it to flip out into the aisle and hurt somebody. So they put a tail out barrier there. As far as guards, point of operation guards. Remember, to be a guard in OSHA's definition, it's got to prevent somebody from reaching over it, under it, through it, or around it. Now, if you take that acronym, it's OUTA. This guard should keep you out of here. So the reach through up above, yeah, that's probably an issue because a small hand could reach far enough through that opening to get into the point of operation dies and become injured. So you're going to have to do something to close down the size of that guard to that portion that's needed. Uh, visibility is also a consideration down at the bottom. says considerations for transparent guards. That came out about seven years ago, and that's a consideration that polycarbonate may lose its impact protection over time, usually because of contact with uh, industrial chemicals or even sunlight can break that down. So the suggestion is to consider replacing polycarbonate every two or three years. This guard is a combination of hairpin guards, if you look at the front of it there, along with um, an aluminum extruded 
framework that holds other types of guard materials, like over on the left side, for instance. Talk about the requirements listed for a point of operation guard in both the OSHA regulations as well as the ANSI standards. We already talked about OUTA, and that's the most important one, because if it's anything less than OUTA, it's not a guard, and it could be an OSHA violation. OSHA's Table 0 10, which contr uh, controls guard openings and guard distances. I'm coming back to explain that. You don't want to create pinch points between the guard and the moving machine parts by the way you design and or install the guards. You've got to be careful of um, secondary hazards of pinch points. Good visibility into the point of operation sometimes involves polycarbonates and sometimes not. We'll see some other examples as well. Fasteners require some sort of a tool. OSHA's big on that, even if it's a simple tool. What they don't like to see are wing nuts to hold guards together. So these first five items here come, are found in both OSHA regulations as well as ANSI standards. The last two with an asterisk at the bottom are found only in the ANSI standard. Material strong enough to protect people and free from sharp edges that could injure people. Both of which are common sense, they just don't happen to be listed in the OSHA regulations. So remember this list. If you're designing your own guards or whether you're purchasing guards from outside, I mentioned OSHA's Table 0-10, which is what you're looking at up above. This actually came about long before OSHA. OSHA was, what, 1971? Well, this came about back in 1949, when Liberty Mutual Insurance and the ANSI Standard Writing Committee got together to design, to design a table, which has been converted to a ruler type thing here, to measure guard openings and guard distances. <clears throat> now this is based on a woman's size six glove with average finger length. That's what they figured in the late 40s would protect about 95% of the people out there operating machines. Later on, 1996, the same two groups came back and said, well, you know, there's a lot more people out there in industry with even smaller hand sizes. Specifically, Asian women were mentioned for that. So there's a guard opening scale based on a woman's size four glove with average finger length. Uh, who would use that anti-guard opening scale? Well, I don't think it's gonna be OSHA. That would be maybe an insurance company loss control engineer or a private safety consultant that gets into a plant where there's a lot of people in there with very small hands. So both of those guard opening scales are available on our website, by the way. You take the two scales, the OSHA scale and the ANSI scale. I'm looking at the bottom left. Those are passing through exactly the same size guard opening. Notice the OSHA scale locks on the third stair step, whereas the ANSI scale locks on the last stair step because it's designed for a smaller hand. You look at the top right photograph, the OSHA scale comes in, and notice between that yellow dotted line and the die itself, there's a, maybe an inch and a half, which is good. It means we just passed a test on the OSHA scale. The lower scale there, the ANSI scale, <clears throat> a portion of that passes into the die. So we just flunked the test on the ANSI scale. Could we fix that? Yeah, we could make the guard uh, mounted further away from the hazard, or we could make the guard opening smaller, one or the other. Guard distance, guard opening, remember? So you can determine which of the guard opening scales you want your guards to meet, and that's what you go with. As far as guard interlocks, <clears throat> hinged or movable sections of guards, like a door, hinge door like these, um, are set up in this case, so when you close the door, you slide the latch over, which then puts the actuator of the interlock switch in the body of the switch to make the circuit. Notice the unique shape of the key, and that one in the lower left there, which makes it much more difficult to cheat. I mean, you can't use a screwdriver or a piece of metal that's laying around. You need that size and shape key. The one in the top right has got the same unique geometry on the key, but you notice that black plastic tab? Well, when the operator slides a handle over, once, once he closes the guard, there's a solenoid inside the body of the interlock switch, which locks onto that tab. 
and won't let it go until the hazardous motion of the machine has stopped. So it's a latching guard interlock switch electrically interfaced either into a timer if the rundown time of the machine is predictable and consistent or interfaced into a motion detector if it's an unpredictable amount of coast down time. Couple of reasons to function test your guard interlocks before you start every operating ship. The first is to make sure the interlock is working, doing its job. And the second is to make sure it hasn't been cheated or bypassed, which may be one and the same thing. But anyway, it's important you do that before every operating shift. So when we make references down here at the bottom to other function test checklists, well, that'd be one for light curtains, for tooling and controls, for perimeter guards. There's a number of different things that should be checked out before you start every operating ship according to the best safety practices in the ANSI B11 series of safety standards that I mentioned before. OSHA does not specifically call out the need to function test like the more current ANSI standards do. Two-hand control is always a better choice to safe, I'm sorry, to operate, to initiate the cycle of a machine than a foot switch. A lot more accidents with foot switches than with two-hand controls. So just as an actuating means, it's a better choice. If you want to use a two-hand control as a safeguarding device, it is possible if you're manually feeding the machine one part at a time and single cycling it in between, in between each feeding of the part. But there are rules in order to do that. We won't take the time here to go through them, but some of them are listed. Protected from unintended operation. It's got to have an anti-repeat circuit. Concurrent with a half second time limit. Holding time, interrupted stroke protection. Anchored at a, at a fixed safety distance. A lot of these are covered in the blogs, which Carrie mentioned earlier, if you need details on these. Light curtains have been out there since the mid-1950s. This is an infrared sensing field with two light bars, transmitter and a receiver. On the left set of photos where it says point of operation, that's designed for somebody reaching through the sensing field. If they're reaching through the sensing field, go to initiate the cycle, let's say with a foot switch, machine won't go, won't cycle, prevents cycle actuation. If they've already initiated the cycle and the dies are coming together, they reach through the sensing field, it'll stop the machine fast enough to prevent somebody from getting injured, providing it's mounted with enough safety distance from the dies based on the machine's response time, stopping time. We're going to get into that more later. On the right set of photos, you've got perimeter or area light curtains where the beams are spaced much further apart because we're not concerned about somebody reaching through those light curtains so much as we are concerned about their walking through that sensing field and getting on the wrong side of it. So with perimeter or area light curtains, the beam spacing is much further apart. Now, if you look on the left, left side of this uh, slide, remember that light curtains can only be used on machines that can stop consistently and immediately anywhere in their stroke or cycle. You've got to be able to quick stop the machine without tearing anything up to be a candidate for a light curtain. And there's a lot of machines out there that can use light curtains based on that definition. Here's a mechanical power press using a light curtain. You see the yellow light bars in the front? Also has two-hand control out in front of that. Also has hard guards around the sides, bottom, top, and back to keep other people out of there. Now that combination, light curtain, two-hand control, and hard guards everywhere else, is really very common, not only on presses, but other machines. Very common combination of safeguarding. Does that mean you can't use a foot switch along with a light curtain and skip the two-hand controls? No, you could. That's still legal in the United States. Now, some of the Western European countries have prohibited that or limited the use of that because they realize that two-hand controls are a better choice. There's a two-sided perimeter light curtain where the beams are spaced far apart, again, for somebody walking through the sensing field. Keep in mind, they don't want any more than 24 inches in between the beams so somebody can't sneak in between them. And that three light beams are usually more effective than two. Is it okay to go around the corner with mirrors? Yes, it is. There's nothing in the standards or regulations that I'm aware of that prohibits you from doing that. Two things you can do with light curtains, just real quick. 
Uh, the light curtain must be active during the hazardous portion of the machine cycle. Well, on the machine like a press, you have a crankshaft rotation, starting at top dead center, TDC at the top, and going clockwise. So you have to make a full 360 to cycle that machine. Now, from top dead center going clockwise down to the quarter inch die opening is considered the hazardous portion of the cycle where the light curtain has to see anything going through it. But from the quarter inch die opening continuing clockwise back up the top dead center is oftentimes the non hazardous portion of the cycle during which you can automatically shut off or mute the light curtain if you wish, assuming there are no hazards going on during the upstroke. Some machines yes, some machines no. So muting is shutting off the entire light curtain during the non-hazardous portion of the cycle, assuming the light curtain is applied to a machine that has a non-hazardous portion of the cycle. Blanking is totally different. You can see two blanked areas on these light curtains. The bottom one has too many cells or channels blanked out. Somebody could stand off to the right side of that machine put their entire arm through the sensing field and reach the dies without tripping any of the active cells or channels on the light curtain. That's a problem. So that's over blank. It's an accident waiting to happen. And yes, it's an OSHA violation as well. The one on the top, you know, at the far end has some cells or channels that are blanked out, but that looks to be relatively reasonable. They're blanking for the shaker trays that go underneath the die parallels to allow the scrap to come out. And I sincerely doubt anybody could reach through that area up over the active area and get into where the dies are closing. Might be able to reach underneath the parallels, but I don't think that would be a problem, at least from this angle, if the picture is taken. So we got muting and we got blanking. Every light curtain has a detection zone limit, as some of the manufacturers call it. A dead zone is also a common term. This one, thankfully, is marked. See the black line there? Well, check to see if your light curtains are marked for their dead zone. And if they're not, might consider that you mark them. Put an object through the sensing field and see where the active area really starts. So that, first of all, you can tell whether the light curtain is properly mounted. Because if you have a problem with that dead zone and somebody being able to reach through it and getting into the hazard area, it's usually a simple thing to move the light curtain down to take care of that. Now the top of the light curtain also has a dead zone. These dead, zone, these dead zones can be two and a half inches all the way down to a, maybe a half an inch. So it varies quite a bit from one light curtain manufacturer to another. Indicator lights, like red to show that the light curtain's obstructed, amber to show you've got some blanking going on, whether fixed or floating blanking and green to show when you're clear. You'll find that in most every light curtain, but not necessarily in this position of the light curtain case. Function testing light curtains. Oh yes, this is something that you should do before you start every operating shift. And it is not a one size fits all function test procedure. Oh no. You got to have a make model specific procedure provided by that light curtain manufacturer, which includes, see those black sticks the operator is holding? Those are test rods. There's a fat one and a skinny one. Well, you need usually two test rods of different diameters depending on the beam spacing of the light curtain. Beam spacing sometimes referred to as minimum object sensitivity. So you may have to go online to get the function test procedures from the light curtain manufacturer and find out if they happen to sell function test checklists for that make and model. If they do, by all means, get them from the light curtain manufacturer. If they don't, at least have them tell you what the diameters of those test rods have to be so that you can make them yourself. So this has to be a make model specific function test procedure unlike the ones for two-hand controls or guards, which are pretty much generic function test procedures. So go on to your light curtain manufacturer's website to find those procedures, and you may find that function testing is already there. You just need to print it out and train your setup people on light curtains. Safety distance. We've mentioned this before. This is required for two-hand control being used as a safeguarding device and for light curtains 
and there may be other safeguarding devices that also require safety distance. You can see them listed in ANSI B1119. What's OSHA's basic formula for safety distance? Well, that's to measure the machine's stopping time in seconds by interrupting at the, well, if you're talking about a press for the crankshaft rotation, you interrupt at the 90 degree position of crankshaft rotation. Take that number, multiply it by the average reaching speed of 63 inches a second, and you come up with an OSHA safety distance number in inches, which in this case is 12 and a half inches from the light curtain to the front edge of the largest, heaviest die you use in that machine. Now, that's OSHA minimums. Been that way for 46 years, hasn't changed. The ANSI standard, I'm talking about B11.1 now, if you're talking mechanical power presses, has been updated to be more stringent and better match both the Canadian and European standards and puts you way much further away than OSHA, like 10% um, maybe for two-hand controls and 40 to 50% for light curtains. So if you're following the best practices in the ANSI standards, you're going to be further back, and it's up to you as to which of those formulas you would choose. To measure safety distance on a machine that has linear motion, like a press, like a press brake, and it could be mechanical or hydraulic, by the way, uh, if you have a relatively new control system with a built-in stop-time measurement device, like most of the solid-state controls have had for the last 20-some years, then you're okay. It's built in. But if you have an older control system, say a relay logic control, that does not have a built-in stop time measurement device. That's where this portable device comes in. Now, it's a simple thing to use, whether you're talking about safety distance for two-hand control or for Likert. It does not require any electrical connections. You can walk up to a machine and in about the space of 10 minutes set it up, attach the magnetic components, uh, and uh, make the 10, normally 10 tests that you need, and document the readings. This is something you're supposed to do when you first install the light curtain or two-hand control, as well as on a periodic or regular basis thereafter, which is normally quarterly, four times a year to do a stop time measurement test. Safety blocks, for those of you that happen to have mechanical power presses, and you are, say, adjusting or repairing the die while it's in the press, OSHA requires that you have a safety block. Now, notice this one has a chain with a yellow plug on it. So in order to remove the safety block from its holder, you have to pull the plug, which is a cutoff for the main motor. However, that doesn't stop instantly, does it? It takes a number of minutes to coast down in some cases. So you have to wait until the flywheel has totally coasted down before you place the block between the dies, as they have done here. Also notice there's a nice short chain on this plug so that you cannot remove the safety block from its holder without pulling the chain. You don't want to see chains that are four, five, and six feet long. It should be short. We also have a blog post on that if you look on our website. Those of you with press brakes, the word brake meaning bend, bending the material across a long narrow axis. Uh, the ANSI standard you want there is ANSI B11.3-2012. I think I mentioned it before. Here they're using a light curtain for safeguarding, and I believe what's going on down there is foot down, foot through sequence. The operators outside the sensing field the light curtain, one depression of the foot switch brings a machine down to where the dies are open just enough to feed the part. Now the light curtain is muted, as we explained before, so you can place the part through the die against the backstop, hand support the part if he wishes, while he makes another depression of the foot switch, which cycles the machine. So foot down, foot through sequence with the use of a light curtain. The only thing suggested here is you add a corner guard around the end of the light curtain back to the frame of the machine so nobody can reach around the back corner. Laser safe is one of the manufacturers making a laser safeguarding device designed specifically for hydraulic and possibly servo drive press brakes. This is not for mechanical press brakes. 
So um, it's a safeguarding system referred to in the ANSI B113 as a close proximity point of operation laser active optical protective device which is mounted with a zero safety distance. You may have noticed in the previous slide the light curtain had some safety distance between the light curtain and the dies. This has none. It shoots right down the blade of the die, which is why it can only be mounted to very fast stopping hydraulic or servo press brakes uh, that can stop in time to justify mounting with a zero safety distance. There are four or five manufacturers out there. LaserSafe happens to be the one that our company carries. So the laser device for hand-holding small parts, that's the main reason they manufactured this to begin with. So somebody can hold hand, hand hold small parts up close. The other reason is down here at the bottom for parts that already have a tall side leg, like this operator's feeding here. Because in both situations, a light curtain wouldn't be very effective, simply because you'd have to blank out too much of it to do you any good. The operator could reach his hand or arm through the same blanked area that you're feeding the part. So that's the two main reasons for laser devices. Um, you can check them out. And we also cover those, I think, in our monthly training seminar. Danger signs. Um, yes, you need signage on machines. A lot of litigation comes from the failure to warn against the recognized hazard. And in recent years, since about 2000, danger signs have had pictograms or international symbols like this for those that might not speak the language. So yes, they have never-nevers and always-always listed there, but they also have the three primary ways people get hurt with press breaks whether they get their hands in the dies at the top, whether they get caught on a box form on the one right below that, or whether they get hit by the piece part as it bends up over on the right-hand side. So pictograms are a big deal with danger and warning signs, and some people end up making their own signs. If you do that, you can refer to ANSI Z535.1, I believe it is, for the color coding standards, so you know what colors to make the various components on that sign. Of course, grinders. OSHA's always been tough on grinders because they have a machine-specific regulation, sometimes called a vertical regulation, just like they do in mechanical power presses and several other machines. So there's lists of do's and don'ts on grinders. You can find some of these on our website as far as those lists. You can also find them on OSHA's website, uh, OSHA.gov. The primary thing they cite is down here at the bottom, the eighth inch opening between the work rest and the wheel, which of course wears down as the diameter of the wheel decreases. So you need to consistently check, regularly check, for that eighth inch maximum opening between the work rest and the wheel. The other thing is a quarter inch max opening between the tongue guard, also known as a spark arrestor, and the wheel. It's another thing that you've got to consistently adjust. Uh, with bench or pedestal grinders, remember OSHA requires that you ring test the wheel. That is, before you, wheel, before you mount the wheel, you suspend it from its center hole and tap it around its outside diameter with a non-metallic object, like maybe a piece of hardwood, to see if you can ring it like a bell, a bell tone, as opposed to the thud or cracked plate sound you'd get if the wheel is cracked, and you never want to mount a cracked grinding wheel. For larger grinding wheels, there's a vibratory, uh, vibratory sand test. You can lay the wheel flat, spread sand over it, turn on the vibration, and the sand will uh, migrate away from the crack if it's a cracked wheel. Um, also remember uh, that the wheel cover needs to cover the spindle end and nut, like this one does, but there's a problem here in that all the fasteners for the wheel cover are not attached. That's another OSHA consideration. Um, you want to stand off to the side for a full minute when you first start a bench or pedestal grinder because if the wheel's going to crack or shatter, meaning explode, right, it's usually going to happen within the first minute. So stand off to the side. Full face shields have pretty much been the norm for PPE for the last 20 years or so that I can remember. So just safety glasses aren't really considered enough. So here's a 
grinder check gauge for both the work rest and the tongue guard that you can use. Of course, once the wheel has stopped, you don't want to use this while the wheel's still in motion. And I believe those gauges are also available for purchase on our website. Talk about metal saws, whether it's circular saws or band saws or hack saws. Um, most OSHA violations come because there's an unused portion of the blade exposed. That shouldn't be exposed. It should be covered up by a blade guard like it is in the top left one, but on the bottom right one, it's not. So when you have blade guards, you want to consistently be uh, adjusting them from the size of the opening you actually need to cut the part. And if you don't have a blade guard, you need to buy one if the manufacturer's still around or make your own, for that matter. Pressure-sensitive mats have to be attached to the floor. You see the yellow ramp on these to make sure people don't move them out of their way? They also need to butt up next to each other so there's no space you can sneak in between them. And thirdly, they need to be large enough so you have to take enough steps on that mat so the hazardous motion stops by the time you reach the point of operation or the swinging tube that's coming around on this horizontal tube bender. So anchored to the floor, no space in between, large enough to stop the hazardous motion in time to prevent injury. Well, how do you know that? Is it stop time measurement device? No, it's something you have to simulate and try because there is no recognized method I'm aware of to say a mat needs to be a certain dimension. It depends on the machine that you are applying it to. And notice this one has two hand controls over to the left side. A radio frequency device is not common anymore. There used to be four or five manufacturers. I think it's down to maybe one or two manufacturers now. These are best, I suppose, for safeguarding an oddball shaped hazard area that's not conducive to a flat plane of light that an infrared light curtain offers. Although on the bottom one, I think they probably could have used a light curtain. On the top one, uh, you can see the copper tubing on the left side. Well, that's the antenna for the RF device. You're looking for, you safety inspectors out there, insurance people, what you're looking for here is either copper water pipe as an antenna material or heavy wall galvanized steel conduit or flat aluminum bar stock mounted usually to nylon standoffs to ground it and then connected to a control box. The problem with these is you can adjust the sensing field. You're supposed to be sensed, so I think some of the manufacturers recommend at 18 inches away from the antenna. Seems like a common number. I don't think that's in the regulations. But anyway, you can turn down the size and shape of the sensing field to be only like two inches instead of 18 inches. Well, there's quite a difference there, right? So that's the Achilles heel of devices like this is people turning down the sensitivity. Also, the material on the soles of your shoes will determine the ground contact that you, the operator, have with the floor and the effectiveness of this device. Um, objects that you move into the area may affect the size and shape of the field. So it's important to check this thing not only before you start each shift, but even during the shift to make sure that sensitivity has not wandered. And by the way, as far as the type or category of this device, it's, it's lower than, say, light curtains. Eye curtains would be a category of type 3. This is a, like a, a, a type 2. And so are pressure sensitive mats for the most part, a type 2 device. Drop probe devices, ring drop devices, halo devices, those are the same uh, device with different names, are mentioned in ANSI B1119. Um, this is something that mechanically verifies the absence of hands or fingers into the point of operation by dropping a probe down first to make sure the only thing underneath the probe is a piece bar, not your fingers. What is it most commonly used on? It would be riveters. It's got about a 95% success rate on riveters. Spot welders, yeah, there's some applications. Maybe roughly two-thirds of what you use on spot welders might uh, be accommodated by this device. So what does it look like? Well, on the left, you see one of these on a spot welder. So the operator can still handhold the part, which they like. They can still use a foot switch, which they like, and it won't slow them down as far as productivity. So you got a win-win there. You just have to make sure you're carefully adjusting the probe 
the, on the shiny steel rod coming down with a loop on the bottom, that has to be adjusted for just enough space underneath it to accommodate the face bar and not your fingers along with it. Over on the right-hand side with a spot welder, uh, yeah, that, that's um, a long stroke device meant for spot welding, which can accommodate, well, not as high a percentage as the uh, riveter, but still there are applications for it. Talk about cutting and turning machines, like a lathe. What's the number one accident on an engine lathe? Somebody leaves the chuck wrench in the chuck as a storage place when they're not running the machine. They forget it's there. They want to run the lathe. What's the first thing they do? Hit the motor start button. Chuck wrench is in the chuck. Takes a number of rotations and finally flies out of there. And it's actually caused fatalities which is why you want to use a spring-loaded self-ejecting chuck wrench like the one you see on the right, which comes in a number of sizes. I know our company sells eight or ten different standard sizes. Now, on the top left of this photo, you'll notice there is a motor starter, and it is a manual-type motor starter that does not offer dropout protection or anti-restart if you have a power loss and the power comes back. So, look at your machines. If you're following the NFPA 79 Electrical Standard for Industrial Machinery, all machines should have some sort of dropout protection, usually with an electromagnetic starter. Dropout protection. What happens if you lose power? Machine comes to a stop. 15, 20 minutes later, power comes back. Does the machine restart unexpectedly? If so, you got a problem. That's where you want to replace the manual starter with a magnetic motor starter. People say, what's OSHA require on an engine lathe? Point of operation. Well, point of operation guards, no. No, not on an engine lathe. The best you're going to get to protect people from becoming entangled in the rotating chuck would be a shield, a hinged shield. You see four different examples up here, all mounted with a hinge, so they're in the open position so you can see what's going on. So these are manufactured by a number of companies in a wide variety of sizes. Uh, you could use them for a three-jaw chuck. You could use them for a collet either way. Now, do they have to be electrically interlocked like these two shields are? No, there's nothing in the U.S. standards that require interlocking shields, at least not in this point. European standards, yes. Matter of fact, that's where these shields came from, the European manufacturers, because both the chuck shield on the left side and the chip coolant shield on the right side have an interlock built into the base of the hinge, making them difficult to bypass or defeat. Another concern on engine lathes is the lead screw, feed rod, traverse rod, camshaft that you find rotating on the front of the machine. Well, that's an entanglement problem. It has caused fatalities. I'm thinking one accident out at... Uh, a major university out east that where it happened about five or six years ago, a young woman got her hair entangled into one of these rotating components. You've got to realize there's a lot of torque with these machines. So you can get a telescopic stainless steel sleeve to cover both left side and right side. I understand you have to go on both sides. The only limitation being the diameter of the largest segment, which the others telescope into. So if that's a six-inch length on that last segment, you use six inches of carriage travel. Shields to knock down chips and coolant. On the left you're looking at a drill press with a simple shield on it to do that. On the right you're looking at a mill, like a, a Bridgeport mill. It's got a shield to knock down chips and coolant. Because again, you're looking at machines where it's impractical to apply the use of a guard that meets out of that we talked about before. No, we're talking shields here. Now let's see, how about another type of shield? It's a two for one. This gives you protection from rotating components, whether it be the bit or the chuck or the shaft, and at the same time is three-sided to knock down chips and make them fall out the back. You can lock one segment up out of the way depending on the length of the drill bit that you're using. So, uh, yeah, this is most people like this. Occasionally, occasionally, small chips get bound up in the sliding parts. They've got to clean out. But um, for the most part, it's a popular alternative to the shields we saw a couple of slides back. Uh, it comes in two different quill sizes depending on the diameter of your quill. It can be set to swung up, swing up from either the front 
or the side. Area laser scanners. And uh, the yellow thing that looks like an eight cup Mr. Coffee on the left side, mounted down around ankle height, projects a laser beam out. Well, I'm looking at the bottom left one here, where there's two different rectangular patterns between the operator and the machine. The light color shading is for a warning zone. The dark color shading is for a fault zone. So if you step inside the warning zone, it flashes a light or beeps a horn and slows the robot down to a crawl speed. Then if you get into the dark shaded zone, that sends a stop signal to the robot. That can be programmed. And no, it does not have to be a rectangular shape. It can be any one of a number of different shapes. You can program that using a laptop computer out on the shop floor. So the lower left is the one I see the most of. The upper left that has two different zones split down the middle is also possible there. Over on the right side, I was talking about access guarding. It's not as popular for a couple of reasons. First of all, the response time of this device is not as fast as a light curtain. Therefore, the safety distance has to be further away. So safety distance is one issue. Secondly, it's not as high a type or category of device like we mentioned before. I think light curtains, most of the better ones, are a type or category four. This is only a type or category three. So it's a uh, lower category. It's a higher price, by the way, like I mean, three times the cost of a light curtain. So uh, the, situ the two situations on the right side would probably be better protected by infrared light curtains than an area laser scanner. Safeguarding and automation cell is usually a combination of safeguard. Light curtains, um, interlock guards, area laser scanners, pressure-sensitive mats, all of which have to tie into one controller because if this thing's sailing along continuous, suddenly stops, you have to know what to, has to be reset. So it's a combination of safeguarding. Uh, let's see. Up at the top, let's just say this person, the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, Robotic Industries Association, has a 2012 version of R15.06. That's the one that you want to be aware of as the most current. However, there's a lot of risk assessment in there and not a lot of tangible methods to safeguard robots, in my own opinion. For that, come down to the bottom of the slide where it's talking about the ANSI RA R1506-1999. That's the one that I think has more tangible methods of safeguarding, even though it doesn't include much on risk assessment. So we're talking about fence height here. The old number from the 1999 standard was to allow 12 inches from the sweep to the floor. The sweep is a horizontal rod at the bottom of the guard, 12 inches. Problem was, there were, two, there were fatalities involved in that with people being able to squirrel underneath the fence because they started up the automatic cycle, realized they'd left their setup sheet inside and didn't want to interrupt production, so they squirreled underneath the fence. And the ro robot made an unexpected motion. They got pinned between the end effector and the solid object. So come down to the bottom where it's a six inch sweep with a 72 inch height. That comes from the Canadian standards, been out there since 2003 and won't allow enough space for somebody to squirrel underneath it because six inches is too small, and increases the height from 60 inches minimum to 72, which would minimize the chance an object can be released from the end effector if you emergency stopped it and the end effector let loose the, of the part. The less potential for something flying over the top of the fence. If you're using a light curtain entry area, like the one on the right, Make sure people can't squirrel underneath that. That's a potential hazard as well. Those of you with conveyors, you can go on to cmanet.org down there at the bottom and get six different in, um, training placards for conveyors. This is just an, an example of two of them. They're free downloads in color. Then you can plastic laminate them, hang them on the conveyor if you wish, and or use them for training on conveyor safeguarding. Another manufacturer you may want to jot down is Hytrol.com, H-Y-T-R-O-L.com, another conveyor manufacturer that offers one similar placard on conveyor safeguarding, English on one side, Spanish on the other side. 
That's for hytral.com. The ones I'm showing you on this slide are English language only as far as I'm aware. As far as conveyors, a lot of people elect to use um, a grab wire e-stop cable. Like you can see the dotted line in that left one there. Uh, sort of continuous emergency stop capability as opposed to mounting a bunch of red emergency stop buttons. So if they start up automatically, I'm reading at the lower left here, they require an audible or visual warning device. Over on the right side, manual reset or start location where the e-stop was initiated is required. Resume operation. Notice that little warning sign there that's got the pictogram we mentioned before. Emergency stops. Um, if you have a momentary type of emergency stop button, it's the red mushroom shape button that returns when you release it. I'm not aware that that's an OSHA violation, but for the last 20 years, electrical manufacturers, electrical device manufacturers, have offered an e-stop that meets NFBA 79, that's the Electrical Standard for Industrial Machinery, for several different things. First of all, it should be a red mushroom button have a manual latch feature so when you push it it stays engaged. You've got to give the button a quarter turn to pop it back out in order to go back to the regular controls to restart the machine. The immediate background should be yellow and it should be readily accessible where the operator works. It also should, it's not on this slide, it also should be labeled to say emergency stop. You want to avoid ring guards, putting ring guards around emergency stops because it might make them less accessible in an emergency. And there should be at least one per operating station of the machine if you happen to be dealing with a machine that has more than one operating station. So again, this is NFBA 79, Electrical Center for Industrial Machinery. NFPA 70E is for an overall electrical safety program. Yes, you need this. This is where they deal with arc flash issues for people that they have to work on panels while they are energized for certain hazard levels of PPE. 79, I think, has a 2015 update, and that deals with things like, as we've already mentioned, Main power disconnects, motor starters, voltage reduction using step-down transformers, grounded circuits, emergency stops, and three different categories of motor stop controls. So these disconnects are lockable only in the off position, which is what you want, whether it's a flange type or a rotary type. They also have, notice, a spring-loaded push button to indicate they're a magnetic motor starter that provides the dropout protection we were talking about before. So you say, well, how do I know my motor starter is uh, magnetic with that feature? The answer is a spring-loaded start button. So if you have questions, please type them in. Um, one we already got here. From mechanical power press run in the single cycle mode are both guards and light curtains required? Well, in the U.S., not necessarily. You could use a guard that meets all the requirements or a light curtain that meets all the requirements. They are more stringent, however, in Western Europe to require both. So I've got another one here. What's the most common personal protective equipment used on grinders? Well, again, a full face shield has been the norm for probably 20-some years now. You can't be too careful on grinders. Let's see, here's one. Um, there's a line marking the dead zone near the bottom of the light curtain required by OSHA or ANSI. Well, that's actually an ANSI best practice. I don't think OSHA actually calls that out as a violation in, say, their uh, 1910 217 standard for presses. So this is definitely best practice to mark a dead zone on your light curtain if it's not already there. And then finally, see, I got another one here. Do industrial machines require dropout protection with a magnetic starter like you described? Well, as to meet NFPA 79, yes, on all machines that's required. Um, I think selected ones are called out on OSHA, but you want to meet best practice, make sure you have dropout protection, also known as anti restart. By the way, there is a um, cost saving way to get dropout protection on smaller machines. Let's say you have a drill press or venture pedestal grinder or a table saw. It's a, it's a plug-in device. I think it's offered on our website. Uh, you can get the hardwired version or one you plug in. But you plug your machine into it and then if you lose power, 
and then the power comes back later, you have to reset this device as well as coming back to your motor starter to reset that. Uh, Carrie? Okay, uh, we do have a couple other questions. I know we're, um, we're running out of time here. If we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to email you back with a private answer. Um, we do have a question from Daniel. For net points, does it matter if the rotating item is powered or free rotating on if it needs guarded or not? Usually the concern is for powered items that rotate. I'm not saying there's not other applications that are free rolling that might be best protected with a cover, but it's mainly when they are powered. Okay, we have a question from Ron. Why are the wing nuts discouraged for point of operation guarding? I think because they're too easily removed. Um, they want something that requires a tool and they check to make sure it's really fastened down tight, not just sitting there loose. But that wing nut thing has, has gone on ever since OSHA came out. I would avoid wing nuts at all costs if I were you. Okay. A uh, question from Jeremiah for a bandsaw. When not in use, does the blade guard have to be at its lowest setting to cover the unused blade? As a best practice, yes, although I think they're more concerned when you are operating the machine. Okay. Um, question from Wolf. What is your view of gloves with grinders? Companies usually establish their own rules on that, and I've heard the full gamut of interpretation. So I think that's a company by company thing. But remember, anything or gloves on any machine now, or gloves can be t become entangled, uh, means that they usually don't allow gloves or that they specify certain types of gloves only. This is a company requirement. Okay. Um, we only have time for one more from Peggy. Uh, do cotton buffing wheel grinders require the same quarter and one-eighth inch openings? No, they don't. Uh, there's certain processes not covered in OSHA's 1910-215 for grinders and buffing wheels, soft grinding wheels like Scotch-Brite, wire brushes. Um, um, I'm thinking there's, you know, and sanders. That's the other one, are not covered by OSHA's requirements for grinders. Okay, so um, thank you all for all of your questions and your attendance. Just wanted to remind you that we have another webinar coming up in June, uh, Risk Assessment versus Machine Survey, which is right for your organization. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning, if you feel like you'd like to get deeper into um, machine safety compliance, feel free to register for uh, our two and a half day hands-on uh, seminars that are held once a month at our headquarters training facility in Rockford or can be conducted at your location. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please just take a moment and um, give us an evaluation as to how you think this webinar uh, went today and feel free to um, reach out to us with additional questions and comments after the webinar. Okay, thank you so much for voting. And that's it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.